Welcome to The Contemplative Life. Three pastors, friends, and spiritual companions help us explore spirituality through a contemplative lens. I'm Christina Roberts. I'm Chris Roberts. I'm Christina Kaiser. We're glad you joined us. Well, hello. It's great to be with you. Today, we'll be talking about viewing our ego from a compassionate perspective. And I say that, and I I, want to offer two different paradigms as we think about ego. The first paradigm, I think, is probably more prevalent. When we think about ego, it's, it's this inflated sense of self, and it's often talked about in a negative way. Uh, rightly so. And the second paradigm is more from a psychological perspective. Carl Jung talks about the ego being the conscious self. It's the self that we think about and it's our conscious mind. And one of the things that he talks about is delving into the unconscious mind, becoming more aware of our unconscious mind and letting that permeate to the surface. And so as I offer those two different paradigms of the ego, what comes to mind today? This is fascinating. I wonder, like, actually, I'd love to kick it back to you for a minute and just have a sense of how do you think you're experiencing the ego? And then, um, and then maybe I will chat again, but which one of these do you most resonate with? Well, I think I resonate with both of them. I think I having an understanding of ego as the conscious mind, I think, brings about an awareness of what you do think about. And so I think with that perspective, you can you can think about mindfulness. What are you actually thinking about? And then delve into what do I need to think about? What, what does it look like to go inside? And I think about ego as a sort of a negative We recently had someone on our podcast, and we'll just call him Ken. And you can go back to the episode that where we interviewed Ken, and Ken defines the contemplative as growth that the ego can't take credit for. And I really like that definition. I've delved into ego uh, for for many years now, and I I first started to notice ego in in the first paradigm whenever i would be called into into a meeting or someone asked me hey can i talk to you and they wouldn't tell me what it was about and so there was this nebulous thing out there and my mind started thinking about what did i do wrong or am i going to get am i going to get a promotion am I, and so my my conscious mind started thinking about in what ways is this about me and as i started to sort of reflect on back reflect on these experiences the meetings were hardly ever about me they were about how the organization needs to get better or what we can do. And it was more of a team thing, but I, I, I tended to make it about me. That's a way in which I started to look at ego. So I would say, I, I think they're both helpful. That's great. That's super helpful for me to kind of like, see how does what I've been learning lately even fit into both of these paradigms? Uh, I was in a teaching not so long ago where, uh, and some of you may know her or not, but her name is Jan Lundry, and she runs a spiritual guidance training institute. But she did a compassionate talk as well on this notion of ego, and I found it very helpful, particularly for some of the things that you're talking about around uh, the all these things are happening inside of me, and my 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 mind is reacting. And so she was saying, you flow in and out of these states all day long, that somehow this is what it means to be human. And apparently, like, we try to repress this sense of being human, that some, oh, I've got to get rid of these negative ones. But she was more talking from an unbiased perspective. Can we get to a space of neutrality more often? Can we just kind of name it, observe it, this kind of a thing? Uh, So, yeah, she was contrasting the ego as like one state of mind and then maybe the spirit as another state of mind. And the spirit stuff reminds me a lot of the fruits of the spirit. But the whole teaching almost reminds me of the cloud of unknowing where like down here we have fear and you can progress all the way up through like love and joy and happiness and isolation and denial. Like all these would be throughout the spectrum. I found it useful to be able to look at it from a compassionate perspective to be able to say, okay, even a really spiritual person who's working on this stuff a lot and maybe even isolates themselves and has all these disciplines still has this flow in their life of having a moment of being in fear, being in irritation, being 
scared, whatever it is, we're all living through this and we flow through these moments throughout our day. Can I get in touch with that? Can I get aware of that? See when that's happening to me. Yeah. I think for me, I maybe struggle a little bit with the idea of ego and what is ego. And maybe part of that has to do, I understand the inflated sense of self that obviously nobody wants that in our lives, but I think I wonder about the opposite where there's not enough self coming to the table and what does it mean to, to shrink back so much? And so where does ego play into different conversations or situations? And so I think, so when I hear ego, while I totally understand the not wanting to over, I also just wonder, and maybe what you guys think about the under inflated ego or the, I guess, deflated would be the word for that. And do you see that in a personal experience? Are you observing that in the world? I would say both. I mean, I think certainly sometimes being female in um, and, and not to make it about male, female, but sometimes that dynamic when I'm in meetings with primarily males and the females in the room, I think oftentimes there needs to be invitation for more ego to maybe show up in those conversations. And where some of my male counterparts who are very aware want to you know, be promoting shrinking the ego, which is wonderful and, and getting more voices at the table. And at the same time, obviously we, we don't want that overinflated. And so I just find some tension there as we're um, thinking about this idea of ego and, and how that plays out. Yeah. I think you bring up a good point where we, we, we talk about ego as something that manifests itself out in the world. So you can have an over manifested ego and you can have an under under manifested ego. And I think you know, back to the male female thing, we're not quite there yet in our society where females are, have an equal place at the table. In certain circles, I think that that's true. But I wonder in the spirituality circles, uh, I think there there's some work that still needs to be done as a male, uh, someone who is given a voice uh, and has been given. Like, what do you think? I've been able to state what I think many, many times at the table. And so I think it's it's been a, a, a great journey to learn about ego and you know, my, my thoughts and opinions maybe don't need to be stated at this time. They're not that important. Let somebody else have uh, the microphone for a little bit. So that's one way that I feel like I've helped promote underappreciated voices, but I think I still have work to do because I, one of my favorite sayings is that ego is always on the bus. It's just whether it's in the driver's seat or not. That's that's the question. I can't you can't get rid of your ego. It's it's always there, but it doesn't have to be in the driver's seat all the time. Yeah, and I appreciate that. And I think even in circumstances, again, Christina, your question isn't me personally. Certainly there are many times where if I'm about ready to do something, there are sometimes is a question of am I doing this in service of the other or am I doing it somehow to inflate myself or to get myself noticed or to get a, you know, at a girl type of a thing. And so I think definitely there's those pauses. And I don't know if that's what you're referring to with this teaching of that awareness. And there are times when it is more appropriate for me to hold back on that because really it's in service of me. It's not in service of the other. And we can go without that particular thing being named. And it can just, I think sometimes life or the spirit can bring things about. It doesn't have to be me driving that necessarily, Chris, to your point about driving the bus. So, so yeah, I definitely think that, you know, that awareness piece certainly makes a lot of sense. Yeah. As I'm listening to both of you talk, I'm realizing all these teachings that come into play. Like, uh, what do I have control over in my world and what do I not have control over in my world? I even think back to that a book I mentioned a while back, Awareness by Anthony DeMello. And he is so in your face about it. Like if you have an image of something that was the, and so we do, like I often have had that similar experience of feeling like I can't get a word in edgewise. And <laughs> what I'm saying doesn't feel like it matters. So what can I do in that situation? So if I try to channel that inner mystic, if you will, I suppose the only option that I have, but maybe this isn't true, but what's coming to mind is, to get still enough to be able to say, what am I feeling right now? Am I feeling overlooked? Am I feeling embarrassed? Am I feeling underappreciated? And then be able to name that to say like, I feel, and this is a common story, I think for a lot of us, I feel underappreciated. I feel underseen. I feel like my voice isn't heard. Um, and it's interesting in this training that I was in, she talks about, she calls it the 90 second rule um, though I don't think that that's a technical term. It's just what she's using. But she says like an emotion, with the exception of maybe sadness, which sadness tends to last longer, uh, has a bell curve, if you will. So it rises 
And you feel that however you feel that. You feel that in your body. You might feel that like your heart is pounding. You might feel like a tension, but it rises and it comes to a peak and then it wanes. The question is, is how long does it take for us to have that emotion, get it to rise and then get it to wane? And apparently you can become skilled enough to see emotions come and go in like 90 seconds. I'm not there. I think I've practiced this lately. I'm at like 12 minutes, I think. <laughs> I don't think I could do 90 seconds, but this business of noticing something, naming it, breathing through it, or it occurs to me like breathing might work for some people, or maybe it's journaling, or maybe it's going for a walk or something, but some kind of contemplative act, and then the emotion passes and walks on. Um, that feels like the only thing that I have charge over, how this meeting is happening, I can maybe do very little about, but what's happening internally is something that I can do something about. I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, I, I liked what you, you, you sort of started um, with the idea of control. What do we have control over? And I think one thing that, that's been super helpful for me is this, you know, Richard Rohr has a book called Adam's Return, and it talks about these, it, it's about initiation rights and stuff. And uh, how that's missing in our society. And um, it's it's really a book for males and females, but it's really speaking to uh, to the issue of males. And males are on this trajectory of ascent, like climbing, 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 which is all stroking the ego. And he says, like, there, there, is, there is really no way to sort of learn to check your ego unless there becomes a descent descending into yourself or, you know, life happens, the death of a loved one or a hardship, infertility, whatever, whatever arises in life that causes you, causes you to descend. That's really the only thing that can help you uh, take a look at ego. And so, uh, you know, some of the things that, that he says, I think there's five principles, but, but one of them is life is not about you. And you are not in control. Your life is being done to you. And I think these are important concepts uh, to understanding how to maybe think about yourself, how to look at ego uh, and to realize, you know, life, your life isn't about you. Your life is being done to you. And I, I think we're, we're not in control. And I think it takes some some experience of out of controlness to uh, to help us take a look at things like that. Yeah. And yet I think too, in that life is being done unto you, certainly that happens. And I would say in, from my perspective that then we then get to choose how we show up in that moment or with that circumstance that's unfolding. And so I do think that that is also an important piece to name that as it's being done unto us, we, we do have agency as well in those different moments. Yeah. And I feel like some of what we're talking about too, is this classic contemplative thing of setting an intention, even like, okay, I know this is going to happen in my life. What's the intention that I want to set ahead of time for when I'm in that space, uh, which I've been trying to do that. And I have found even in my own experience, I probably need to share my intention with somebody. It's not enough for me to have set up an internal intention. Sometimes I don't have enough uh, willpower to see it through. I think <laughs> so I need accountability. I need other people to be with me and be like, remember, we, we set up this plan. We had an idea that we were going to try together. Yeah. And I think it's interesting too, even Christina, hearing you name almost like an intention, a forward looking intention. You also mentioned a little bit earlier, kind of in the moment that 90 second to 12 minute <laughs> response to the emotion. I think I tend to be more of a slower processor. And so I'm, I'm not so great in the moment, but after the fact, that is when I tend to do the reflective pieces and maybe thinking about, you know what, um, and maybe in the moment I realize I have to set ego aside or lean into ego or whatever that means. But then after the fact, like, okay, what, what was that about? And what was coming up in me? And then having time to kind of work through those things, I think then helps me to show up a little bit differently the next time and, and to work through some of those inner workings of the ego. Yeah. I love it because I'm with you. Sometimes the moment is too charged. And so it can be helpful. Uh, and, and in fact, my Noom app talks about this too. Sometimes an emotion is too intense. And so you employ a distraction with the intention to come back to it. I find that amazing that, you know, my Noom app is also talking about these things. But that's a, it's the same thing that you're saying right now, right? Like, I can't do it right now. I need to set it aside and, and handle it later. And I also 
coming back to this one little point that I flitted through before, just how useful is it to be able to say to oneself, this is just what it means to be human. I'm going to float in and out of this state of mind all the time. And I'm going to have this dominant force that I'm not really enjoying sometimes. And that's life. I like the idea of making micro adjustments as we have these different encounters in life uh, and, and maybe having some time to reflect on that encounter didn't go like I wanted it to go. How can I make a micro adjustment to show up and be more present to myself and how, how I'm, how I'm being in the world and being more present to others. So I, I like that idea of making these micro adjustments as, as we're going through this thing called life. What a great conversation we had today. I really enjoyed talking about ego and, and what it means to be contemplative and be compassionate towards ourselves. Well, it is time for us to move into the part of our podcast where we talk about what we are into. What are we into today? Well, I am into the TV series, Call the Midwife. And uh, like the title suggests, it's about midwives in Poplar, England, kind of serving the poorest of the poor in that district. And I remember when the season first started thinking, how in the world are they going to have a bunch of stories about babies being born? But they're on season 10 now, and it is a beautiful, beautiful series. I learned so much. It is a combination of these midwives that live with um, nuns and sisters serving in the East End of London post-World War II. And I really love the series. So I am into Call the Midwife. How exciting. You find such interesting shows. I love it. Uh, I am into daffodil bulb planting. So I don't know if you guys can remember, but way back last spring, I noticed, look at all these daffodils that came up and our, our property was new to us. We didn't have any daffodils. So I am remedying that. I have bought all these daffodil balls and scattered them throughout the various places. And hopefully if magic does its thing, <laughs> if science does its thing, um, in the spring, we'll have all these beautiful yellow flowers that pop up, so. That is what I'm into. Well, I am into late night conversations with my children. Uh, most parents know that uh, at some point in their children's life, they stop talking to their parents about different things and <laughs> they're into their friends and, you know, getting them to have a conversation with you is like pulling teeth. And I've been looking for opportunities to be present to my children. And it tends to be whenever I am saying good night to them, all of a sudden they have these life defining questions and uh, I can either be present to them and uh, their question, or I can say, I'm tired. I want to go to bed. And I found incredible joy in their questions. And so I've, I've been enjoying late night pontificating on the meaning of life with uh, my two oldest children. And so I'm into late night conversations with my kids. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it was a pleasure to be with you. If you're looking to go deeper in your spiritual journey, we invite you to check out the spiritual direction page on our website, which includes even more practical information about what spiritual direction and companioning is all about. Until next week, let's have a great week. Mm -hmm.